30 seconds for Don Fry to put away Thomas Ramirez. Oh, my. Don Fry definitely belongs in the Hall of Fame just for the sheer entertainment that he's given the fans. You know if Don Fry is fighting, you're going to see something fun. I, I can fight either way. Ambidextrous, I can go left, I can go right, I can go up, I can go down, I can do it all. There's nothing that I cannot do. Don Fry just wanted to come in and brawl with you and put on a show. He was one of the best to ever step in the octagon, there's no doubt about it. But that larger than life personality had just made it even more fun to watch. And and he took a chance against some of the toughest, most badass combat sports athletes of his time. Winner of our first bout, Don Fry! He also represented something uh, pretty important, and that was, you know, just this, this evolution, this combination of styles for the first time, really. Donnie Fry wins it! And David beats the Goliath! He was able to kind of be the forerunner of what we think of today as a complete mixed martial artist. Once he jumped in there and fought, he was an exciting fighter with talent and well-roundedness and a guy that you wanted to see fight and a guy that you were interested in listening to. Don's like the all-American guy and absolutely incredible fighter. He left his mark on UFC history. Guys like Don Fry, he is the last of a dying breed. Don Fry's legacy is toughness. When, when you fight him, you know it's going to be a fight. There's no, he's not worried about points. He's trying to take your head off each and every time. It's like being a trained dog, an uh, attack dog. Uh, you have a job to do it. You see somebody, you do it. Don Fry is a massive legend of this sport and a massive legend of the UFC. Ladies and gentlemen, fight fans and fellow fighters, Please welcome the newest member of the UFC Hall of Fame, Don the Predator Fry. see some of you made parole to be here tonight. Well, I'm a little surprised about this to be here day two. I found out about this the same way you guys did. I was watching UFC 99 with a bunch of buddies and we were all smoking cigars and drinking beer and the announcers started talking about the who's going to be next in the Hall of Fame. They showed Dan Severn and I walking to the octagon and I said, geez, Dan Severn's been in the uh, Hall of Fame for years. Doesn't anybody there talk to each other? Bunch of dumbasses. <laughs> then they showed me fighting. Then they showed more of me fighting. And then I said, holy shit. I think they mean me. I don't know what you guys thought, but it shocked the hell out of me. I thought this door was slammed shut and bolted up a long time ago. Cause I got this well-earned reputation of uh, opening my mouth and not worrying about what tumbles out of it. So let's see how it goes today, what do you say? <laughs> so far, so good. I don't have to take you off the stage yet, you're done. <laughs> it's time, <yeah. laughs> I'm going to start by thanking Dan Severn for getting me in the UFC for the first place. I was going through my first divorce, and I figured I could make a few bucks and, while well, kicking some ass. Plus, I needed a vent real bad. I've been kicked in the head by a horse a few times, so I figured, what the hell, if I could take that, Getting punched by a guy in a pair of white pajamas couldn't be so bad. <laughs> so I'm part of the team to help Dan get ready for the ultimate ultimate. And I'm there at fight week with him in Denver. I should also tell you that 
I'm paying for my own meals and paying for my own hotel room. Because the last time Dan Severn opened up his wallet, a bunch of dead spiders fell out. <laughs> Cheap son of a bitch. <laughs> That's okay, I'm in Denver on a scouting mission. I'm following Dan everywhere, taking mental notes. And about four hours before we got to go to the arena for the first fight, Dan announces he needs something from the grocery store. So he walks in that direction without another word. So me and the entire team are following the beast around this store, just hours before the UFC event. Like he's mother duck and we're his little ducklings. He's going up and down every aisle. We're thinking, what the hell does he need so bad right now? Finally, the great beast finds what he so desperately needs. Two huge boxes of black hair dye. Because that's what's on his mind, his gray hair showing up on pay-per-view. There was another time I said thanks to Dan Severn. It was a morning after UFC 10. The one tournament I entered, but I didn't win. Dan comes into my hotel room to say he's leaving for the airport. I'm so beat up, I couldn't even lift up my arm to shake the man's hand. I was just a giant bruise from my head to my ass. So I looked up at Dan through my swollen eyes. Well, Dan, thanks for getting me into the UFC. None of this would have happened without you. <laughs> and there's a lot of other people I need to thank, including my family, my mom and dad, the entire McMinn family, Bobby Douglas, Art Martori, Coach Martinez, Coach Clark, Coach Williamson, Coach Taylor, Coach Peckinpah, Steve Owen, Rocco Ciatoli, anyone else who I ever called coach or stood in my corner. Thank you for everything you taught me and for all the time you gave me. I'd like to thank everyone at the UFC because they've been real great to me all week. The only complaint I have is that um, they told me I could choose the picture they'd use for my autograph cards. But the one I asked for was me in a bar with Paige Van Zandt sitting on my lap. <laughs> I tell you, man, seeing the female fighters in the UFC is crazy to me. Ugh. The world's changed a lot since 1996. When I got into this, the liberal do-gooders were freaking out that guys like Dan and Tank were punching each other in the face. What the hell did they care around anyways? These guys are ugly to begin with. Now we got female fighters who look like supermodels fighting in the octagon. And they are real fighters with real skills, I'll tell you that. Hell, maybe they should have started off with those girls in the first place. I mean, given the choice, who would you prefer to see in Speedos, me and Tank Abbott or Misha Tate and Holly Holm? <laughs> no one's gonna vote for any politician who wants to ban that anyways, are they? There are some real great athletes and some skilled fighters in my day. Plus, you had to be tough guys who show up, the type of men who could win any fight you put them into. But to be a UFC champion, you had to win three fights in one night. And that takes true grit. There was an art to winning those eight-man tournaments. I got it right twice. at UFC 8 and then at the ultimate ultimate. UFC 8 couldn't have gone any better, I'll tell you that. I won all three fights inside four minutes combined. The only time I was worried was when I was looking across the octagon at Gary Goodridge. 
I didn't see him until we were in the octagon, and I thought, God damn, you one big son of a bitch. <laughs> but I won that fight, and then I went to UFC 9, and before that I went to UFC 10 in Birmingham, Alabama. 20 years later, I'll admit I almost didn't come out for that final fight with Mark Coleman. I remember after I beat Brian Johnson in the finals, the semifinals, ran my fingers through my hair and my hair was bone dry. There's just no fluid in my body. I had nothing left. And Coleman was waiting for me in about 12 minutes. Scary shit. I thought about making up an excuse and pulling out. It crossed my mind, I'll tell you that. Hoist did it, Shamrock did it. So maybe I should do it. But then I looked at the guys that they had for alternates. It would have been criminal to send one of those kids out there <laughs> to fight a monster like Coleman. So I went back out there and I took my ass whooping just like a man should. Losing sucks. Uh, it's just like my first wife. I never could learn to live with it. <laughs> so I entered the ultimate ultimate tournament to prove I was still the best in the world. And that was the best night of my career. The ultimate ultimate was when I showed them exactly what I was all about. I rematched with Gary Goodridge for heavyweights. We put on a hell of a pace. Then I went on one of the semi-final fast, and finally I fought Tank Abbott in the final. I, my team begged me not to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, but I figured what the hell. Be good for shits and giggles. <laughs> and Tank put me right on my ass. And then uh, I said, holy shit, he hurt me. Hear me so bad, 10 years later, my children were born dizzy. <laughs> Tank kept coming at me, and we both headbutted and went out for a second, and I recovered, and he didn't. Being Tank Abbott in a fight like that, choking him out at the top of his game, surviving what he hit me with, that was a hell of an accomplishment to leave the UFC on. And from that, I moved on from the UFC. I was offered great money to go into pro wrestling, and New Japan Pro Wrestling. I grew up watching Ric Flair and Terry Funk. Always wanted to play a bad guy or a heel, as they say in wrestling. Plus, I thought it'd be easier on the body than fighting for real. And I got that one wrong. Somewhere along the way, I broke my neck so bad, the Took a few three millimeter chips out of the very vertebrae. Then they had to fuse three others up together. And despite the injuries, I was back in the ring in three months. I was happy wrestling until I saw Mark Coleman win the Pride Grand Prix. Then I got jealous. I thought, well, if he can do it, so can I. But now I can be honest. I wasn't the same fighter I was in Pride as I was in the UFC. I've been gone for four years, and the neck and the leg injuries from pro wrestling have taken a toll on me. When you fight overseas, you automatically become a representative of your country. I debuted in Pride two weeks after the 9-11 attacks. One of the proudest moments of my life was carrying old glory into that ring. that alone was worth coming out of retirement. But also had two of the greatest brawls in Japan. First, I finally got my fight with Ken Shamrock. I wanted that fight for years. Shamrock had a win over Dan, and I wasn't real happy about that. And I was a little pissed off that Shamrock got all the early attention. Hurt my ego. 
So I remember watching some news report call him the world's most dangerous man. I thought they must mean when he's behind the wheel of a car or something. So for years I talked bad about Ken any chance I got. And to anyone who'd listen to me, I really went over the line. I was unprofessional. I feel bad about now, but I got the fight. I thought because Shamrock had never won a UFC tournament, he wouldn't be able to keep up with me. I screwed that one up too. <laughs> but we had a hell of a war. That guy cranked those heel hooks so bad on me and I should have tapped, but after years of seeing what a bum he was, there was no way I could lose to him. I won the decision, but as any of these fighters here today will tell you, no matter what you say coming in, you come out of the, one of those fights respecting the other guy. I've never sent Ken Shamrock a Christmas card or anything, but I've never said a bad word about him in 14 years either. My other big pride fight was against Yoshihiro Takayama-san. He was a late replacement for injured Mark Coleman. Pride actually let me know about that change a whole week before the fight. I didn't know a thing about Takayama going in, but I knew, knew what he was. Oh man, about five seconds into the fight, we went at it hard. Some people say he's one of the best MMA fights ever. All I know is that if you can fight in Japan and you can hear the crowd actually cheering, you must be having a hell of a fight. That was a fun brawl. But it may have been the last time that I actually really felt like the Predator. Getting old sucks. It's really hard to admit it to yourself that you're getting older. Just ask Joe Rogan. <laughs> Joe, I love you, but quit showing up on TV in your kids' t-shirts, will you? <laughs> you try to ignore it getting older at first, but the losses just keep coming anyway. Towards the end, I lost to people who never should be able to walk into a bar and say that they once beat Don Fry in the fight. Do I miss it? Hell yeah, I miss it. I'd have loved to fun to I'd have loved to have fought in the modern UFC. You know, during that pissing contest I had with Dana White on the internet, they said Don Fry is mad because he didn't get the kind of money that he, today's UFC fighters are getting. You're goddamn right, Don Fry is pissed off about that. <laughs> you see the checks, the checks those, that cocky little Irish guy is getting? Where's Dana White at? You know, Dana, if you paid me what you paid McGregor, you could do that. Shit, I'll, I'll do a press conference between rounds. <laughs> you know, I'm proud that we kicked open the door so that guys like McGregor, Demetrius Johnson, Stephen Thompson could walk through it later. Actually, they're not just walking through that door, they're driving Bentleys through it. And they deserve every penny they get. I always called it no old bard. Now it's called mixed martial arts. Whatever you call it, it's the purest sport there is. There's no bullshit, no politics, no favoritism. You go into an octagon and it's just you, your skills, and your guts against the other guy's guts and skills. 
It's the best sport in the world. I'm 51 years old this year. That's old. Don't let anybody bullshit you that's middle-aged. How many 102-year-old people you know? <laughs> oh, Mr. Seven now. I, I think we gotta take a pee break for Dan. <laughs> oh, wait. Somebody wake him up, will you? I've had more fun in my 50 years than most people could have had in 5,000. I've been a fireman, I've been a cowboy, I've been a college wrestler, I've been a pro boxer, I've been a pro wrestler. Hell, I act and do stunt work in movies, and I've been a fighter and a two-time UFC champion. I'm proud of all those things, but let me tell you about the two things I'm most proud of. Number one, that I'm the father of two amazing daughters. They weren't around when their old man was doing the UFC thing, but I want them to know no father in the world is prouder than I am. My girls, Katie and Cassie, along with their mother, Molly, are here today, and I want to let them know I love you all so much. I met Molly during my fight career, and over the years, she put more bandages and gauze on me than King Tut. And now number two on the list. Don Fry is a UFC Hall of Famer, baby. Hall of Famer. No man could ask for a better legacy than that. Finally, I got one thing to say to Mr. Dana White, Mr. Ryan and Fertitta, Mr. Frank Fertitta. Thank you very much, sir. I bullshitted a lot about not caring about this in the past. It's that's because I didn't think I'd ever be invited here unless I was serving drinks. Now I'm standing here, and let me tell you all something. The Hall of Fame is the pinnacle of the sport. This means so much to me, man. Thank you very much. It's a great day to be the Predator. Thank you. declared the winner. There is nobody left for him to fight. It's that simple. You have agreed here to fight an exhibition fight with someone here that they're trying to find to come in here with the octagon with you. Then our Davies comes up to me and says, hey, Don, we're out of fighters. You want to fight? And I just 
being a smart ass. Well, Art, I thought I was suspended. <laughs> Art, he says, well, we can change that. <laughs> and then he walked off, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's been bugging me for 20 years, man.